and that was a great setup by Brian. Um, we haven't discussed at all. I didn't know what he was going to talk about, but there's so much in there that's relevant to what we're doing in Bristol. Um, and to try and set what I'm about to do in context for you, so Brian talked a lot there about the transformation end of um, digital business and the really um, completely different ways that we can reimagine um, what we do as organisations. And that applies to government just as much as it does to business. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm not going to talk so much about that digital transformation, that the complete reimagination of what a, a council might do. I'm going to kind of talk about a layer below that, um, which uh, is a company called FutureGov, who are very influential in the kind of uh, new thinking about digital in, in the, um, the UK. And they talk about uh, government and councils in particular being kind of quite good at doing tweaks to our basic business model, kind of small changes, um, and that we are now um, getting on with getting better at transactional change. And what I'm going to talk to you about is transactional change and how we've um, used LifeRay to do that. And then the third thing, and future government to talk about this as being absolutely imperative for government to get a handle on now, and as, as Brian was talking about it today, it's the same for business, is that transformational layer. <clears throat> so I'm not really going to talk about that, but I'm going to talk about transactions and that kind of core business of government and how we can make that better. And in a sense, what I'm going to be doing is um, I'm not going to go into the depths of how we've used LifeRay. I'm really going to be talking about why. Why have we used LifeRay? And I'm going to do that by telling you all about um, first of all, uh, the strategic context for digital services in Bristol, a kind of helicopter view, and then I'm going to dive into a specific service and give you a real kind of rich example, I hope, of, of how, what's the problem today. Um, what happens in Bristol um, when you try to apply for a residence parking permit, and why is it difficult? And then I'm going to um, look at that as well as from the inside, the process um, difficulties for a city council, also the outside-in perspective. What is it that our service users really need? And I'm going to talk about how we found that out. And I'm going to bring that together then into how do we actually reimagine our working practices? What, what was it we did differently? And I'll then link that to the technologies that we needed, and I'll, I'll bring some of those things in around digital transformation, um, or digital transaction, uh, transactional services. And then I'm finally going to run um, a video which shows you um, our, our digital service in action, because it's live now. So I can't kind of test it in front of you. It's got real data going through it now, uh, real people applying for parking permits. So what we've got is a demo, which was taken um, on the test system just before we went live with it. Uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll narrate it. I'll tell you what's happening in that and explain what's going on. OK, so um, let's go on to the context then. So uh, most of you will probably have some sense of this already. So um, I hope I'm, 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 I'm telling you things that you already know. But basically, the context of, of, um, of change in, in government is um, massively important for, for why we're making the kind of choices we're making. So start off with Bristol. Bristol, in many ways, is a city with, with huge strengths. Um, we've got a very vibrant cultural sector. Um, the creative industries are particularly important. In fact, industry and uh, the, our economy is growing fast now. Coming out of the recession, we're about the second fastest growing economy outside London in the UK. And that's um, supported by financial services, by creative and digital industries, um, by the retail sector. We've got two really strong universities in Bristol. And those universities have a lot of science and technology um, uh, investment and uh, science parks and so forth. And technology in Bristol is something that goes back a couple of hundred years, you know, right back to Brunel and the kind of technologies that were uh, essential part of the Industrial Revolution around railways and iron steamships and all that kind of stuff. And in a sense, Bristol's got a kind of real head start on the digital um, economy now around digital, creative digital industries. And we have um, a very uh, significant high tech cluster as well um, around silicon, uh, as, well as, um, as well as the kind of the web and, um, and creative media. So loads of strengths, but at the same time we have a number of contrasts in Bristol. We have um, a very fast growing population, especially in the under fives, and that obviously puts pressure on schools and it puts pressure on children's services. We've also got, um, although unemployment is lower than the national average, we have it, um, concentrated areas of persistent worklessness in some parts of the city, which are obviously a real concern, and we know that um, 25% of children are in fact growing up in poverty and clearly that's not acceptable in a city that has such rich areas as well. So it's something we have to tackle. 
At the same time, um, like all parts of the public sector, we have a major financial challenge to face. Um, since the recession, since the cuts that the um, gov government have brought in and have passed through the whole public sector, Bristol has had to find ways of reducing our spending op on our operating budget annually. Um, we've taken £55 million pounds out already, but we have another £90 million pounds to take out over the next couple of years. And um, at the same time, obviously, um, as the money is going down, those demands are rising, as I said earlier. So um, that's another challenge. But then you add to that um, an ambition in the city. So we don't want to just simply um, find a way to cope with the situation we're in. We have a very ambitious elected mayor. And um, his vision for Bristol is of a city where we have improved the health and well-being of our, of our population, of our people, that we are getting everybody to share in prosperity and growth, and that as a city it's somewhere that we can all move around safe, um, in a healthy way and um, that the, the economy is improved. So that kind of vision, that challenge, um, as well as the financial cuts and, and the situation um, around us, that all leads to the need to change the City Council quite dramatically. So we had to create a major change programme which involves restructuring the City Council, a large number of people have had to leave the organisation, um, and then reorganising it and redesigning the services, this transactional change I was talking about, so a, a lot of redesigned services, um, as well as political change looking at the, the boundaries of the, the wards and the, the members and so forth. And then underpinning all of that, uh, changes to our workplace, so as with many councils, um, new buildings, completely new environments, um, agile and flexible working, and um, supporting that with process changes, technology changes, and new um, policies, new ways of, um, of managing our people and, and working together in a collaborative way. So there are a whole range of things that we've pulled together as a single programme to, to act on, um, on those problems and deliver a, a new council that's capable of, um, uh, of serving our citizens as effectively as we can. So, that's the context. Now, one piece of that program is a redesign of how residents apply for parking permits. Residence parking in Bristol is something fairly new. Lots of cities have had it for many years, but in Bristol, it's a big controversial political um, initiative. And um, as, as well as being controversial, it's, um, it's, it's very manual, and it's been uh, a challenge to think of how we would actually tackle that. So, I just want to talk you through how, how is it today, and, and you'll see why we need to transform it. So the challenge facing us essentially is that we have this very paper-based process. Um, we've rolled out five resident parking schemes um, in the previous years, and they were all done with paper. Um, so about 5,000 applications a year, um, about 45 minutes processing time, and roughly 10 days, but spikes of much, much, much longer than that for some people waiting for their permits to arrive. And we know that we're going to roll out up to 15 more zones over the next year. And that's going to lead to over 20,000 applications a year. And you can imagine that having 20,000 paper applications coming through is simply not going to work in a context where you're cutting staff and where you know that you, you, know, you can't invest in a, a large team of 20, 30 people to, to process that. Now, and and who, would, who would want to do it that way anyway? Um, so, we have to tackle that challenge. Now, one of the reasons that the, the, the process is like that is because of um, the, the legacy, the history, as it were. So at the moment, the process kind of looks like this. There's a whole load of manual steps at the top there which the applicant has to take. So they, they, it's all done on paper at the moment. They'll get something through the, the post that tells them about their scheme. They'll then complete a paper application form. They'll have to find physical proofs of residency. Um, they'll have to do some maths to calculate how much they, um, they need to pay. And then they put it in the post. And at the other end, we have to obviously do the reverse of all that. We have to read it all, we have to input into systems, we have to do the physical checks on the, on the proofs of residency and so forth. Um, and we have to then post a permit out. So that whole thing is very manual and that's where it takes that length of time. And if you look at some of the steps in that, there's lots of opportunities um, in, sort of lean, in lean sort of thinking terms of, for waste and for errors. So people will send us the wrong photocopied page of their V5. Um, people will um, uh, maybe uh, not get the right evidence of residency. When we ask them to do the maths, we give them a table, which they have to read off, you know, what's my vehicle emissions class, um, what kind of permit do I want, I'm going to do some maths now and figure out how much to write the cheque for. They might not get that right. Unfortunately, there are a number of cases where we have to therefore put the, the application in sort of pending status where we go back and get the right amount of money. Um, so there's all sorts of things there about um, waste and, and uh, you know, things that don't add value. And then obviously we have to then retype all that data in, and that also doesn't add any value. 
So that's kind of the pain that's going on inside the process. But what do, what do service users actually think? Because there's another perspective here, which is this kind of outside-in perspective. And that's one of the things that's really critical about so much of the sort of um, digital transformational change that we're trying to go through. So we wanted to find out what service users really thought. We wanted to put the customer at the centre of the design that we came up with so that we could create digital services that were so good that people would prefer to use them, this mantra that GDS have, have popularised amongst the UK public sector. So um, what we did was we worked with a local company called CX Partners um, who do customer experience, user experience work. And um, they came along, they sat with our, our parking services teams and they, um, they listened to the phone calls that were coming in, they looked at what, what it was like to process the post. They then went out onto the streets, into the the, um, public areas of the city, they did sort of guerrilla research where they would stop people on the street and ask them to look at wireframes and sketches. They would talk to them and ask them questions around their experience of um, parking and how they would expect to um, be able to apply for residence parking. They also went out to two zones that already had residence parking in Kings and Cotton and they asked the people there, what was it like? How did you experience it? How would you have liked it to have been? What would you have expected things to have happened? How would you expect things to happen? And so that was a, uh, a very powerful um, amount of information that came in around people's, um, people's real expectations. And one of the fascinating things actually was that everyone thinks that we're all joined up already in government and that all the kind of data flows across um, DWP and, um, uh, you know, uh, and, and the um, DVLA and so forth and that councils simply know that stuff. Um, people are quite surprised when they realise, um, thinking about your privacy point earlier, Brian, that they realise that actually they do have more privacy than they, they expected. So um, we distilled all of that sort of information, all those sketches, all those kind of um, answers to people's questions into a task model. Um, and this, uh, the line here with the circles, this is the task model, all the tasks that somebody has to carry out if they want to actually get a parking permit at the end of it. And then we overlaid onto that all those pain points that I was talking about in the process, all the things that can go wrong, all the waste. And that really helped us to then figure out how we should respond, what kind of des design we should come up with. And so we were able to then to reimagine our working practices uh, in terms of how they would meet user needs in a, in a more effective way. We took that original process, which was, as I said, 10 days in, in duration, uh, on average, and we basically stripped out all the waste, and we ended up with two main steps at the front end, both digitally enabled, um, some automation, and then finally posting a permit out. And we kept a physical permit because actually people's feedback to us uh, demonstrated that there was a significant interest in having a very visible um, physical evidence that someone has got a permit, both because people didn't quite trust us yet, that if there wasn't a physical piece of paper in their car, that we wouldn't find them, but also I think because they wanted to make sure that anyone parking in their road really was allowed to park in their road um, and had paid for their permit. So, uh, you know, we're still not quite able to move to that virtual permit idea yet. So um, that's reduced that time to about three days duration um, and clearly made that experience for somebody who's applied much better because they receive the outcome of their, um, their request much more quickly. Now that's obviously enabled by a lot of technology and this is kind of where we get to the bit where um, you can understand how some of the things that Brian was talking about, about what LifeRay can do as a portal, sit behind and around that experience. So at the front end, um, finding out about applying and actually applying is all enabled by the new digital services that we've built in LifeRay Portal. Um, and that's improved information, advice and guidance. It's um, a citizen account. Um, and in fact, there we've integrated LifeRay with um, the OpenAM uh, product from uh, Fordrock. Um, and it's using uh, then uh, the, the, the user experience work that we did with CX, integrated as a LifeRay theme um, uh, to provide us with a much better sort of gov.uk style set of forms that are easy to use and give people a, a much more um, sort of compelling experience. And then once they're actually in the process of applying, clearly there's a whole load going on in the back end where um, the LifeRay is then integrating with a variety of things through our um, enterprise service bus. So we're going out to Experian, we're doing checks with um, about the vehicle emissions data and the identity matching. Um, we're also then using business rules to calculate costs of permits and how many permits you're allowed in your zone and for your particular property. Um, we're taking payments in line in the process through um, a payments provider and then we're going on to record that case in the Salesforce CRM and make that available to the parking services team who have to then obviously generate the permit and send that out. So obviously there's no rekeying involved in that. 
So um, that is essentially the, the underpinnings of it. Now there's a much more complex architecture to it than that, of course. I'm not going to talk this through this. Um, we did this work in collaboration with Digerati. Digerati have obviously got a standout in the, um, in the assembly room. So if you want to have a bit of a conversation about the details of this, I know that John Baker and Femi from Digerati are here, and so they'll be happy to, to talk to you about that. And uh, I actually can't talk to you about that. I don't understand the, the full technical details. So um, that's just there to prompt. If you want to find out more, you can go and have a chat with them. So what I'm going to do now um, is I want to now run the video and talk through, I'll narrate through what's happening as the service is applied for. Um, so I think the guys are going to um, switch over to the video for me. That's not the video. <laughs> Somebody gonna sort the video out for me? No? I can always go back to the backup slides if necessary. <laughs> A few technical difficulties. <laughs> and we did all this with Life Ray. <laughs> Right, okay, back there. Uh, uh, shall I use the slides, guys, or are you going to find the video? Uh, okay, cool. Sorry. That's all right. <laughs> so what we're going to show you is basically um, the experience of if you were somebody who was um, a resident, you've had something through your door, and it said, you know, we're about to implement a residence parking zone uh, in your area, um, and it's told you that you can apply on paper, but maybe you want to go and try this new website, this new web service that we've created. And so it uh, takes you through that experience of, of applying online. Um, in a minute. <laughs> Ah, here we go. Right, okay. <clears throat> so you basically land on a website which is specific to residence parking at the moment because this is the first digital service that we've launched. So um, one of the key things that we've done here is try to make this very clear, this kind of information and advice, this content, very clear. It's about you. It's about you living in St. Paul's area and you can apply for residence parking here. It tells you exactly what you're going to need to find um, so you can get your kind of um, information ready. Uh, you know that you're going to be um, providing uh, proof of, of residency and, and also the um, vehicle details. So you start off by putting your postcode in. So obviously what we're doing here is integrating with our um, land and property gazetteer, which is also then checking um, uh, against the matching set of data which tells us which addresses are actually in a parking scheme. So um, at the point that we click next here, this is going to go off and double check that. And it's also checking against rules that say if you've got off-street parking, that limits the number of um, permits that you're actually allowed. When it comes back, it's actually going to tell you exactly for your specific circumstances how many permits you can have. And this is one of the things that we, we found people were phoning us to ask. So hopefully we're trying to reduce the demand through um, traditional channels like phone and, and so forth. Um, once we've then moved on to sort of entering the registration number and so forth, we're also giving people a bit more assistance and guidance here. We, we had lots of people who couldn't photocopy the right page of the V5, so here we, we're showing them with a, an image and a ring. This is the, the number we're asking you to find. Um, once they've actually entered this data, and this is the point at which we're going to go off and we're going to use the, um, the, the services that Experian provide at the moment to check um, that this is a known, you know, known identity at this address with, um, with this vehicle. Now, in future, and we've been talking to DVLA about this, this is a kind of service that is going to be provided through government departments, but at the moment, DVLA can't provide this service for a variety of reasons, and they're working on this in their digital transformation supported by GDS, so we've been discussing with them um, how we will uh, in, iterate this and actually improve the, um, the, the cross-government communication that most people in, in the public already think we have. And what we're showing you here is a, an example where we've got two vehicles. 
Um, and if you've got two vehicles, there's um, uh, a difference in the cost of the permits. The first permit is calculated based on the vehicle emissions class, um, whereas the second one is a fixed cost. So if your um, two vehicles have different emissions classes, theoretically you could end up paying more on your first permit um, than you need to. So we've actually done the checking and we tell people what the best um, the best uh, allocation of cars to permits is, rather than actually you know, taking extra money off them. So we, we, we tell them this here, um, and we show them that we've given them the, the lowest cost permits, but we allow them, if they want to, to change the vehicles around. You might want to have both cars on one permit so that you, know, you, could, you could be flexible about which one you use. So we allow people to do that. Um, and we also allow people to pay um, in instalments. So we've now moved on, and we've um, offered to give them visitors' permits, so they've applied for some visitor permits. And then again, um, we've moved on to an order summary. Now, obviously, in a lot of sort of transactions that you experience on the, on, you know, on any other kind of um, business, you will get this kind of typical kind of shopping cart experience. You will get this kind of summary screen. Government transactions haven't typically done that kind of stuff. So we're trying to take patterns wherever possible from things that people have experienced before and apply them to government services and make it really easy to use. We're then doing a soft registration for a customer account. So once you've done this, once you've applied for a permit, you've ended up with a citizen account with Bristol, which we can then start to build on. Um, at the moment, obviously, it only has one service in it, but we can start building on and um, making, making that valuable to people um, as they interact with us so that we can obviously then, as the next service that they might come to, we already know who they are and we can start building um, that profile for them. We do then obviously run into some of the privacy things that uh, Brian was referring to, and, and actually one of the other things we're, we're looking at now is thinking about personal data stores um, and talking to people like MyDex about how that might work um, in inter interacting with um, our platform here. So then we're going to go off now, and obviously from, from within LifeRay here, we're now actually going to go off to um, capital payments. Now obviously we're on a different site here, this is actually a, a presented by Capita, and we've simply um, made this look as near as possible to the um, look and feel of the LifeRay portal. But it is working in line in a way that the payments engines in councils typically aren't. A lot of the time, if you go to payments on a council website, you may have had to pay a parking fine at some point. You, you usually find yourself on a page which is completely separate from the council website. You usually have to enter all your data there, even if you might have um, already told the council website that you're looking for a parking fine, you probably have to select that again. Obviously, what we're trying to do here is put this in line in, in, the, in the process, draw the data through, um, so the whole thing feels as seamless as possible to the customer. and all the normal kind of uh, experiences you might have paying online are also obviously available here. This is, this is just part, a, a straightforward process, something you would recognize from anything else you've, you've done. And then at the end, um, another key thing, it's a very kind of clear um, and hopefully um, confidence building confirmation that that's, that's worked, that we've got everything, and um, that you'll get your permit in the post in a certain number of days. And again, this is trying to deal with the fact that you know, in, in a situation where we have the, the money's disappearing, we can't afford to handle um, uh, requests that have been caused by waste and by failure. We need to stop people needing to phone us because they don't feel confident. And so this is all about building that sort of confidence. So all of this work's been done, as I say, inside LifeRay, integration with a variety of other systems, um, and it is live now and we are um, having people apply through that, that channel, and we're obviously going to be rolling that out across all the other residence parking zones. And that, I believe, is the end of that video. So um, thank you very much for that. Um, and I don't know that we, we're taking questions now, but um, I'll be available throughout the day. I'll be here all day listening to the other talks and be around during the, the sessions. So i um, be very happy to talk to anybody later on. Yeah, thank you, Gavin. Okay, Can cheers. we give Gavin a hand? Um, yeah, if you don't